Good afternoon. It's Wednesday, the 22nd of July. I'm Erin Viner. This is IBA News, broadcasting from Jerusalem. A Palestinian was shot and killed during an IDF raid outside Jenin today during an arrest operation for wanted men when clashes erupted between security forces and local residents. The incident occurred in the village of Brukin and spiraled into what the army described as a violent riot. Troops opened fire at the main assailant after the mob ignored orders to stop hurling rocks. The dead man was identified as 19-year-old Mohammed Alwane, who was reportedly shot as he was picking up more rocks. Authorities in Israel and the United States have arrested four people in connection with a securities fraud scheme tied to the computer hacking of J.P. Morgan Chase and Company, as well as other U.S. financial institutions. The multi-layered computer crime has tentacles connecting Moscow and Tel Aviv with West Palm Beach, Florida. The Jerusalem Magistrates Court today ordered the 20-day remand of two Israeli suspects who have been identified as 31-year-old Jerry Shalon from Savion and 40-year-old Ziv Orenstein from the Sharon. The state attorney has filed a request for their extradition to the U.S. on behalf of American law enforcement agencies after citing evidence that the defendants were actively engaged in unlawful activity, including the use of forged passports and fake names for their operations. Indictments have been filed in Manhattan against a total of five suspects who are charged with securities violations, fraud and impersonation, which could lead to prison terms exceeding 20 years. Here's how the story first broke on Bloomberg. This is regarding uh, that hack of almost a year ago that affected 83 million individuals and small businesses. Now the U.S. is saying it has uncovered a pump and dump scheme linked to that hack of J.P. Morgan accounts. The security scheme has tentacles, it says, in Russia, Israel, and the U.S. As you mentioned, four people have been arrested in Israel and in Florida and reveal a complex securities fraud scheme that was tied to those hacks, not only of J.P. Morgan, but other financial institutions. Officials are saying a person remains at large. These headlines just coming across. Apparently these folks were um, arrested this morning and represent the culmination of a months-long investigation. Uh, it involves several friends who met more than a decade ago by, at Florida State University. Um, apparently uh, in the indictment here, one, one of these uh, friends is now living in Israel. Another person are charged with securities fraud in a plan to pump up the value of low-volume stocks. The two people arrested in Florida are charged with running an unlicensed money remitting business related to the scheme. So fascinating story here. It looks like behind uh, that enormous hack of J.P. Morgan Chase and other uh, financial institutions will bring you more developments as we get them. Um, but uh, interesting here. And again, uh, this hack uh, revealed just about a year ago, a year ago uh, coming up in August, Mark. All right, Julie Hyman, our senior markets correspondent, joining us from the breaking news desk. Carrie Geiger has been following this story. Carrie, first uh, thank you for your time today. I know you're in the middle of this breaking news. Uh, talk to me about pump and dump. Well, it's a common and it's an old school scheme. You know, we saw boiler rooms doing this back in the 80s and 90s. I think the Wolf of Wall Street could probably sure. be, you know, some form of that was happening. But basically, you either get investors, um, you know, the way they used to do it, they would call, you know, um, kind of unwitting people on the phone, cold calls, and get them to invest in these low volume, most of the time they're penny stocks. And then as more and more people pump money into these stocks, then then basically the fraudsters or the criminals then sell those off and profit from the stock that they're already holding in this. So it's a it's a common securities fraud. Now what we're seeing now as this story unfolds, of course we'll have more details, is you're seeing a pivot away from the old school pump and dump to now one that appears to be tied to a major hack of a U.S. bank. Iran's foreign minister defended the landmark nuclear deal between his nation and the P5 plus one nations during a speech before the parliament in Tehran, which will now review the agreement. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, meanwhile, called an address from Iranian Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, vowing to defy American policies in the region, very troubling. Here with more is IBA's diplomatic correspondent, Eli Wogelenter. Iran's Foreign Minister Mohammad Zarif defended what he said was a balanced nuclear deal with the world powers telling his conservative-dominated parliament yesterday that there was a need to accept that the negotiations had required compromise. I emphasize that negotiating is about giving and taking, said Zarif, and unless a significant level of the two sides' demands are met, no agreement can be reached. 
In order to meet the demands, we have had certain flexibility concerning restrictions and monitoring. This flexibility has been goal-oriented and well-calculated. Zarif elaborated on issues including snapback mechanism, the lifting of sanctions, and supervision of sites. And he told the members of Parliament that Iran maintained most or maybe all of our red lines. The deal must still be approved by Iran's National Security Council and ultimately by Iranian Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei. Anti-U.S. rhetoric continues to be heard from Iranian leaders, much to the dismay of the Obama administration. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry was asked about it in an interview on Al Arabiya television. The Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei said, uh, made a statement <coughs> very negative, and he basically uh, saying that he wants to stay at war with the United States, etc., and he will still support the proxies. How do you read his statement? I don't know how to interpret it uh, at this point in time, except to take it at face value that that's his policy. But I do know that often comments are made publicly and things can evolve that are different. If it is the policy, it's very uh, disturbing, it's very troubling, and we'll have to wait and see. But that's one of the reasons for my meeting with all of the Gulf states. It's one of the reasons for our being very attentive to guaranteeing the security of the region. And we are not kidding when we talk about the importance of pushing back against extremism, against support for terrorism and proxies who are destabilizing other countries. We, it, it's unacceptable. President Obama, meanwhile, is continuing his defense of the nuclear agreement, telling a convention of veterans of foreign wars that hard-headed diplomacy with Iran could avoid the type of unnecessary wars for which they have personally paid the price. And he compared those who opposed the deal to hawks who supported the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003. President Obama said he would press Iran on the Americans still being held in Tehran and that the United States will not give up until they are returned. And we will stand with allies and partners, including Israel, to oppose Iran's dangerous behavior. And we are not going to relent until we bring home our Americans who are unjustly detained in Iran. Journalist Jason Rezaian should be released. Pastor Saeed Abedini should be released. Amir Hekmati, a former sergeant in the U.S. Marine Corps, should be released. Iran needs to help us find Robert Levinson. These Americans need to be back home with their families. Here in Jerusalem, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu continued his attack against the nuclear agreement during a meeting with the Prime Minister of Italy. The deal permits Iran to build as many centrifuges as it wants and to enrich as much uranium as it wants, which means that Iran could break out in a decade or so to dozens of nuclear bombs in zero time. And almost immediately, starting from this year, if the deal passes, the deal will give Iran hundreds of billions of dollars to bankroll its aggression in the region and its terrorism around the world. Italian Prime Minister Matteo Renzi spoke of his support for Israel, but said he holds a different position as regards the Iran deal. I think we have also different positions about the deal of Iran. With uh, the United States of America, we support uh, this uh, compromise, but we think it's possible a compromise for the future of Iran, but it's impossible a compromise for the security of Israel. So for us, this is a first step, but we control, we stay with the international community because there is not a right for Israel to exist. It's a duty of Israel, to, for Israel to exist. The Italian leader met today with President Ruben Rivlin and opposition leader Isaac Herzog, and later he addressed the Knesset. He is scheduled to travel later today to Bethlehem, where he will meet with Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas. Erin? Thanks for that report. In another news, U.S. Defense Secretary Ashton Carter has arrived in Saudi Arabia as part of his regional tour aimed at reassuring Washington's allies about the nuclear deal with Iran. Carter will hold talks with Saudi political and military leaders following similar discussions in Israel and Jordan. The Saudis are staunch opponents of the pact, which they fear will lead to a regional nuclear arms race. Carter is trying to calm those concerns with proposals to intensify military cooperation in the form of special forces training and the heightening of cybersecurity and anti-missile defense systems. While in Amman, Carter admitted that sharp differences of opinion exist between Washington and Jerusalem. We don't agree on everything, and the Prime Minister made it quite clear 
that he disagreed with us uh, with respect to the nuclear deal uh, in uh, Iran, but friends can disagree. Uh, and um, uh, we um, will continue to work uh, with Israel and our other partners in this region uh, to counter the danger from Iran, even as we uh, do the same with respect to ISIL. It was a decade ago that Israel completely withdrew from Gaza and for Jewish communities in Samaria. To mark the anniversary, Minister of Science Danny Danone visited the West Bank community of San Nur that was uprooted in 2005, where he slammed the disengagement as a mistake that will one day be rectified. Today we mark 10 years for the disengagement from Gaza and the northern part of the Shomron. And now we are here in the northern part of the Shomron, where Jews were uprooted by the government 10 years ago. It was a mistake. We need to acknowledge that, that it was a mistake, and we need to correct it. When you come to this place, you ask yourself why Jews do not live here. I believe that in the near future, we will see the Jewish families coming back to Sanur, coming back to Chomesh, coming back to our homeland here in the Shomron, and I hope to come back here again very soon to be part of this important initiative. The state commissioned Locker report calling for far-reaching budgetary reforms in the IDF is drawing many conflicting responses from members of the government and the defense establishment. I mean, it's still not clear to what degree it will be adopted or implemented. Defense Minister Moshe Yalon rejected the findings as superficial and detached from reality. That view was shared by IDF Chief of Staff Lieutenant General Gadi Eisenkot, who countered it with an internal military report, which he says will still enable substantial cuts while preserving the Army's essential capabilities. Education Minister and former IDF officer Naftali Bennett is, however, embracing the Locker Report, calling it courageous and enterprising, while Finance Minister Moshe Kahlon announced his intention to incorporate parts of it into the upcoming state budget. The nation's political system has failed to create a mechanism to curb defense spending. This according to Amots Asael of the Wall Street Journal, who also told IBA's Ari O'Sullivan that the Locker Report will likely just end up collecting dust. Uh, reports on uh, the IDF's budget, um, it will be shelved quickly and then piled dust. But more broadly speaking, um, there indeed is a structural problem in Israel's uh, fiscal conduct. Uh, in the sense that everybody understands that Israel has unique and very expensive uh, military needs and the political system repeatedly fails to create a mechanism that will instill some kind of discipline on this ongoing expense. And yet there was the social protest, social justice protest, where you want to redefine uh, Israel's priorities. And at the moment, wouldn't you say that Israel is safer than it ever was? Well, that, that's a kind of statement uh, that no Israeli is prepared to make since 1973. The question, therefore, is not how safe Israel is, but the question is how much can it afford to spend on its defense. Uh, it's all a matter of abilities, not of desires. And that is why it was very saddening, in my view, to hear Defense Minister Moshe Yalon's arguments yesterday, which were not about Israel's broad fiscal capabilities, but about his, his own narrow perspective about the military needs. And this, in my view, is part of a uniquely Israeli problem whereby the politicians who decide about military spending are, their, are themselves products of the military establishment. Like Yalon, who was a former chief of staff and a lifelong general, one we all admire for his military credentials. But when it comes to designing the national uh, spending system, he seems to be unable or unprepared to make the leap from general to civilian. And this has been a problem throughout Israel's history. Will the investigation into excessive spending in the Prime Minister's office directly impact Benjamin Netanyahu and his wife Sarah? The couple's spending habits have been scrutinized for many years, although they have so far overcome allegations of any financial impropriety at both their private home in Caesarea as well as their official residence in Jerusalem. For now, the spotlight is on the Deputy Director General of the Prime Minister's office, Ezra Sidoff, and an electrician who has long worked for the Netanyahu family. 
Uh, as far as we know, the investigation right now is about wrongdoings in the residences, the private residence and the public residence of the Prime Minister. And uh, wrongdoings means that uh, people were uh, worked, you know, for both residences illegally or beyond what could be expected of them, etc. And uh, we don't know, you know, whether, uh, but probably there is a basis to suspect that something which was not um, proper was done in the residences, whether it was criminal or not, we don't know. Turning to Paris, where a state prosecutor is recommending that the inquiry into the death of Yasser Arafat be closed. French forensic scientists dismissed claims from the wife of the late Palestinian leader, Suha Arafat, that her husband was the victim of a political assassination after a forensic examination of his remains by independent French, Russian and Swiss experts two years ago showed no sign that he'd been poisoned by polonium, as she'd alleged. Arafat died at a Paris hospital in 2004 at the age of 75. The official cause of death was a massive stroke, although physicians at the time said that they were unable to establish the origin of his illness. No autopsy was carried out at the request of his widow. French magistrates must now determine whether or not to honor the prosecutor's recommendation to drop the case. U.S. Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump is continuing to gain popularity among potential voters, according to the most recent polls, despite his outspoken views. Trump is refusing to apologize for controversial comments he made about U.S. Senator John McCain when he told a party forum that he doesn't consider the former Navy pilot to be a hero because he was captured and held prisoner in North Vietnam for more than five years. The real estate mogul continued to take aim at his political rivals as well as foreign nations during his latest campaign rally in South Carolina yesterday. This guy, Lindsey Graham, so he calls me a jackass this morning. And I said to myself, you know, it's amazing. He doesn't seem like a very bright guy, okay? He actually probably seems to me not as bright, honestly, as Rick Perry. I think Rick Perry probably is smarter than Lindsey Graham, but what do I know? So Lindsey Graham says to me, please, please, whatever you can do. You know, I'm saying to myself, what's this guy, a beggar? He's like begging me to help him with Fox and Friends. So I say, okay, and I'll mention your name. He said, could you mention my name? I said, yes, I'll mention. And he gave me his number, and I found the card. It, I wrote the number down. I don't know if it's the right number. Let's try it. 202. 228. 0292. I don't know, maybe it's, you know, it's three, four years ago, so maybe it's an old number. 202-228-0292. So, I don't know, give it a shot. We give state dinners to the heads of China. I say, why are you doing state dinners for them? They're ripping us left and right. Just take them to McDonald's and go back to the negotiating table. Seriously, it's true. While Ukraine continues to struggle with armed conflict in the east, the Jewish community in Kiev has launched a mission to build homes for those who were forced to flee the ongoing conflict. They've decided to name the new town Anatevka, the fictional Jewish shtetl in Imperial Russia created by Shalom Aleichem in his story Tevye and His Daughters that became the musical Fiddler on the Roof. We get more about the initiative in this report from Ellen Dorfeva. Since the start of the armed conflict in Ukraine last year, many thousands of Ukrainians, including many Jewish families, were forced to leave their homes and became refugees due to the danger from armed clashes. In the capital, Kiev, the Jewish community organized to help their brethren, and what has emerged is a new Jewish shtetl that they call Anatevka. Located only 30 minutes from the center of the city, the land for the new village was bought by the community in order to create a safe and comfortable refuge for the misplaced Jews. The project is already under construction and when completed it will include apartment blocks, a school, an orphanage, a medical center, a synagogue and a community center. Organizers also plan to build a small museum of Ukrainian Jewish history. 
The chief rabbi of Ukraine, Moshe Asman, founded the project in an area that was once the location of a Jewish tattle prior to World War II that includes the grave of the great rabbi Mordechai Tversky of Chernobyl. Rabbi Asman said that they hope to complete the houses and the educational center by the 1st of September because of urgent needs for homes. Rabbi said, God willing, we are building a town here. For the past years, the community has been housing Jewish refugees in their own homes around Kiev as well as at one summer camp facility. They have been provided with food and employment, but Jewish leadership came to realize that a more permanent solution was needed. This refugee says she came here with her family from Lugansk. They stayed there as long as they could, but after continuous bombings, they decided to come to Kiev. The hardships of a stagnant Ukrainian economy and rampant inflation has encouraged many Ukrainian Jews to immigrate to Israel. Some 7,000 have made their way to this country, including many who arrived on special flights. Whether it's a return to the shtetl or a return to the Jewish homeland in Israel, what's clear is that great change is taking place for the Jewish community of Ukraine. This is Alan Dorefeva for IBA News. The entertainment world and fans across the globe are today mourning the passing of award-winning performer Theodore Bickel at the age of 91 of natural causes at a Los Angeles hospital. Bickel was born in Austria to a Zionist family and named after Theodore Herzl. The family fled the Nazis in 1938 and moved to mandatory Palestine where he made his stage debut at the Habima Theater in 1943, filling the role that he is most often associated with as Tevye in the musical Fiddler on the Roof. After studying at London's Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, he moved to the United States where he gave thousands of live performances of Fiddler on Broadway. Bickel also created the role of Captain Von Trapp in the Broadway production of Sound of Music and appeared in more than 150 films. His career in television spanned three decades and Bickel was also an accomplished guitarist singer who recorded albums of Jewish folk songs. In addition, Theodore Bickel was a longtime activist in civil rights and the Soviet Jewry movements. Now taking a look at local finance, where the shekel today lost strength against all major foreign currencies, while share prices on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange were also down across the board this afternoon. Here's a look at the numbers. Temperatures, on the other hand, are going up, though, and the IBA weather team tells us we can expect warmer temperatures tomorrow as we head toward a Sharab desert heat wave expected to hit us on Thursday. Here's the forecast at home and abroad over the next 24 hours. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. We hope you'll join us again tomorrow, and I'll be back to bring you the latest breaking news from Israel. We now leave you with Theodor Bickel singing If I Were a Rich Man from Fiddler on the Roof. I'm Aaron Viner, wishing you a great evening, and shalom from Jerusalem. If I were a rich man, all day long I'd be